Oh, and we're back. Number three, third design team we're sitting down with this season. Already did Infinity. Uh, Shane Gwaltney for Music City Mystique. Sitting down, as you can see from the podcast or video title today, with the GMU staff, or part of the design team, not the whole thing. Uh, we'll introduce them in a second, but how you been, dude? I think it's been a week. It's been good, you know. We're in daylight savings time, so life feels right again. I don't feel <laughs> like I have to go inside my house and be a hermit um, mm -hmm. and ignore the world. I can actually stay outside. Uh, the weather's kicking up. It feels like spring, which also gets me excited for these later season regionals that are coming up, WGI finals that is really like a month and change out. So yeah, it's like four weeks. Crazy. It's pretty nuts. So, four or five weeks. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's going to be fun. Yeah, before we get into sitting down with the design staff to go over their show program and all that stuff, design and everything, uh, welcome everyone to the Asia Out Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Fantini, and with me as always is Evan Worrell. And before we jump in, make sure if you're on podcast services, go watch the video on YouTube, comment, like, subscribe, follow on Facebook and Instagram, uh, go to patreon.com or hit the join button right on YouTube if you want to support us financially for as little as 99 cents a month. Every little bit helps, but we love everybody for the viewership all the same no matter what. So... Evan, take it away. Let's introduce these guys, and then we'll get into it. Uh, yeah, first of all, just a shout-out to these uh, guys who took some time to come hang with us and talk about their show this year, about their design process for this show, and just share a little bit more about it. So hopefully it obviously helps people out there trying to get a little bit more seasoned with their own design and just helps us understand the product for their program and their membership. Uh, we'll start off with our, with our friend Dan Shack. Well, they're all our friends, but we'll start off with Dan Shack. <laughs> just tell us a, a little bit about what you do with GMU, maybe how long you've been there. Take it away. Yeah, for sure. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me on again. I feel like there's like a third or fourth one we've done. It's always good. Um, I'm the creative director uh, with GMU, and uh, this is the first year I've taken over the battery manager role as well. Um, I believe this is year eight with the group, so rocking and rolling getting close to the big one zero <laughs> and then uh also our friend travis peterman joining us in the house what's up travis yes sir what's up guys thank you for having us um yeah with gmu this is also year eight for me and i am the program director as well as the battery designer for the group Sick, sick. And then also a former educator of all of us, really. And then also now a friend of the, the podcast, Mr. Tim Fairbanks. What's up, Tim? Hey, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, my name's Tim Fairbanks. I'm the visual designer at VMU, and this is my first year on the team. Heck, yeah. Very cool. Um, so the show title this year, The Devil You May Know, um, which right off the rip, spurs all kinds of like internal conversation as an audience member and i'm sure as an adjudicator uh so dan kind of take us through what were some of the early conversations with this program how you guys landed on it etc yeah for sure sorry i want to just super quick fact check it's the devil you know not the devil oh, you may know the devil you know um, all right yeah very good very yeah good. he's already ticking i never we're like three <laughs> yeah. three and a half minutes in and he's already ticked no, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. We're, we're correcting the people who missed the announcement as well. But um, I think the inception of the show kind of started with um, our desire to design out of our identity that we already have built and continue to build since um, even before we were with GMU. Um, and looking back and trying to put a theme through some of the shows that we've done, I think um, feeling like we don't necessarily fall into one of the like prescribed buckets of WGI and design and always feeling like we're, you know, somewhat on the outside, um, constantly trying to figure out like, why are we so weird? And like, why don't people get us? So <laughs> those original conversations were like, we want to do something dark that works really well in the drumline medium. That's going to let us hit gawk shots and be aggressive um, and we started to go down the path of a sort of like an anti-hero um, villain role. We talked about a show called like Against. We talked about like just going in this path of embracing the, the differences about how we design and even thinking about like when we did Fringe in 2019 or what would have been the outlaw in 2020. It was very much like that was the essence there. So I think we wanted to take sort of the the essence that we've built, um, the identity that we built, and then elevate that with sophistication, elevate that with complexity, and 
probably most different than what we've been doing is just pull ourselves out of like a narrative design structure where things need to like mean something all the time. And there needs to be like a linear, um, like logic to like what the story is. And we've done that quite a bit and it's, it's handcuffed us a bit. This, this goes in more of a like open-ended conceptual direction. Um, that's meant to reach the individuals experiencing the show instead of us like beating you over the head and telling you what, devils you know yeah that, that makes a ton of sense um obviously when it's done well creating a story arc where you have this person and they kind of go along a journey and reach this euphoric ending or whatever existential ending is is awesome but it does lend itself to a, a lot of obstacles so i do enjoy the idea of just like creating a world that like hey we're gonna live in i also think it makes it easier for the spectators and hopefully the adjudicators as well to kind of immerse themselves into the program instead of just being like a viewer of the program um so I, travis i'd imagine ahead, it Mike. would give you way more creative freedom not locking your in yourself into a storyline so then if you get a random good idea within this world you've built to live in for the seven and a half minutes you're like oh we can actually do that like we're not in some narrative spot where it's like well i'd love to do this but it is what it is so i think that's probably really smart from a creative and design standpoint so I'll start with Travis, and then we'll we'll bounce over to Tim. So you guys kind of have this idea uh, of a show and this world that you want to immerse yourselves in. Do you then start picking out music that you think will work, um, and then obvious, obviously visual stuff that will cohese with that? What's uh, what's next on the docket once you kind of like have the idea you want to go for? Sure. I feel like we're a very flexible team in that way. Um you know, I think we, we do our best to go wherever the next good idea is, like wherever it starts, then if it's a visual inspiration, if it's a musical inspiration, if it's a vertical moment that we want to try to fit in the show, we just kind of, you know, go towards what appears to be, you know, the best idea and then figure it out, figure out how to connect it and make it all kind of work together. But um, I think in this case, at least from my memory, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like we started getting into some of the source music and just really wanting to live in like the New Orleans jazz type of style. And while we're not telling a very specific story where you feel like you need to understand something at every turn, um, it very much is something that we're intending to feel kind of cohesive. And like you guys already said, like a, a world to be lived in where we create the immersion with, uh, with the music and um, you know, how they're, how they're moving to it that uh, just kind of feels like it's real, like it's a real seven and a half minutes of the audience's experience in this concept, as opposed to something you have to, you know, follow dot to dot, per se. Yeah, absolutely. In the beginning of the show right away, with, you know, the saxophone introduced immediately, I think it's the first thing you hear with the string bass, is that right? Uh, the upright bass, just an automatic kind of sultry and sensual sort of jazz, like you're in the bar vibe. Um, and then, so we have to portray that in a visual medium as well, uh, audio visual representation. So Tim, when you, when you're starting to storyboard, are you starting to pick out colors that you think work? Are you thinking floor first, uniform first, or like all encompassing? Take us through that a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh um, one of our one of our first inspirations uh, was the piece Papers from Hades Town. Um, I'm a big fan of that musical, and Great. the story of Orpheus and Eurydice is a it's an amazing story, right? But we really tried to not tell that whole story because um, obviously it takes Hades Town two and a half hours to do it, and to try and get us to do it in seven and a half minutes is impossible. <laughs> um, however, there's there's a, there are some scenes, you know, the end of movie two this spiraling thing where Eurydice is going down to hell and you can hear the music pulling us into the earth. And if I've never seen these type, I just think that's cool. I just think it looks cool and it's visually motivated and it's compositionally correct, et cetera, et cetera, to try and get points, right? But if you have seen Hades Town and you're like, oh, that's Eurydice going down, then that's even extra cred and, and uh, comprehension from the audience member. So, you know, the costumes, um, the idea of a real stark devil feeling without going like late in these blacked out I'm, I'm looking like a devil 
Um, we wanted to be a sophisticated version of that. There's some um, like Brad Pitt movies where he's the devil, where we wanted to look classy and super intelligent and not necessarily the screaming type of devil. Um, and then the floor, uh, the floor is, is kind of multifaceted. It's really just white. There are some designs in it. There's some glyphs and some things that are really a couple hues away from the white that if you're up close to it, you can see them. Those are really there for the members. Um, but it just represents that purity of everything that we have. And it gives me a chance to use line in a different way with the starkness of the red lines in their uniform and the blackness of, of the costumes. And we use a lot of velvet and some like mm. fake leather that's really dense and it sucks up all the light. So the contrast between that and the horror is something that we really wanted to kind of, um, you know, sink our teeth into a little bit. Uh, do you want to pull up a picture of that real quick so people can get a, yes. see if uh, we can do the, this the uniform, so the people uniform, can get right? a good visualization yeah, of the uniform. Yep. Um, I think one thing you said there, Tim, makes a lot of sense. You know, you didn't want to do like this angry, like kind of super contrasting devil, but something that's almost like, you know, versus what you just said, I think of like Al Pacino and the devil's advocate, like this person that's just like suave and like, you almost like, Oh, I want it. Like this dude is like, I don't know. Like he's pretty, yeah. he's pretty sweet. Um, in like from a theological sense too, that I know that's not what it is, but it does make sense on that level too. Like a lot of what you see in like the real world, as far as like imitation is just like a one-off or like a copy cat kind of thing that makes you question like, ah, oh, is this like the legit thing? So, uh, so the uni's that resonates up now, with me. So we're on the yeah. uni scene. So you can talk about it if you want, or just the velvets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, obviously you have the, the sashes and stuff that go down to create, was that kind of a, uh, an intentional too? like, Hey, we want to do something that like sinks all the way to the floor. Yeah. And quick shout out to Byron Valentine at, at Fred J. Miller. Um, he's just awesome where, I get to take the ideas that we have and give him kind of free reign. You know, we say we want this, 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 and then don't micromanage him. Let him just job as a creator, and he just nails it like consistently. Um, I think this is one of his one of his best uh, creations. Um, and then we also use some of the lines in the uniform. The red it, when you turn around, there's an allusion to the horn, the devil's horns. There's a couple of those sprinkled throughout where we're using. Um, more of a literal image and symbology, but in a much more figurative way, right? We don't have, we, we didn't want to look like Halloween costume devils. We wanted to just be mm -hmm. much more mature than that. Yeah. Um, the capes on the side uh, are kind of indicative. There, there's lots of, like you were talking about theology. We went through every version of devil that you can possibly imagine. And then kind of all the things that we liked from the different ones. And there's a lot of, a lot of symbology with a long dress or cape that the devil or Satan will wear. It also gives us other opportunities for like the VE. We get more emotion. We get some things um, just to, you know, it's, it's a lot of line. It's a lot of black against white. And we wanted to give other opportunities for them. Um, and that's one of the reasons too, that all of the performers are the same, right? We homogenize all of them. When you look around at all the people in your life, everybody looks the same and you're not sure who the devil really is. So we didn't want that, like the VE to be different or the pit to look different. They all are the same thing. You, you're just not sure, is that the devil in me or, or are you the devil? Yeah, totally. Um, I think that reads extremely well in obviously the contrast too from the uniform and the stark whiteness of the the floor as well it's just a great dichotomy and juxtaposition you you kind of get that play too on like a heaven and hell just within that that visual palette um i'm gonna bounce back to, go i'm ahead. gonna switch this to the opening set so people can see the contrast of what we were just talking yeah. about the white floor with the stark uh uniforms let's see and we we can talk over that go. too um so I'll, I'll jump over to dan real quick so when you guys have the show and you have what you're wanting to do in this world you want to live in, do you then start thinking of, all right, what type of ideas and moments do we want to create? Tim touched on like the Hades town thing that you can, you can hit there. Do you make like a checklist of like, this is something we could do. This is something we can do. Uh, and then start trying to like pick like, Oh, this would work for our medium. Like, Oh, we're never going to pull this off. What's that kind of process like? 
Yeah, it's it's all that running in parallel, to be honest, um, which is always really cool and fun. Uh, it really is. And we work with some like amazing people like, you know, Andrew Montero, Monty, he is our front ensemble and sound designer. And he's like literally a beautiful mind. Like the music that comes out of his head is like unreal. And he literally taught himself Final Cut Pro and edited our full 2021 virtual project. Like Cole just figured it out. We also brought on M Mark Eichenberger, who's serving as a keyboard front ensemble arranger um, as well. And he has just added so much clarity and so much process to what we're doing. So um, obviously those two, Sam Fleming, who's our sound designer, Joseph Noah, as well as Carolyn Drizzlane, who's who's really our um, lead choreographer, um, kind of like alongside me. Um, Got to just shout out all those people because they all contribute so much to this. It's not just us three, but I think that like one thing that, you know, we all took away working under Tim at Rhythm X is that originality and novelty is only going to be bred from novel processes and open-mindedness and you can't plug in to a mechanical process and then expect something to come out that's different so we didn't go in like this is our design process and how we do it especially bringing tim in we wanted to basically intake all of the experience that he had all of the different perspective and tack that onto what we've been doing well, but also reorient ourselves so we don't keep making the same mistakes. And that is part of our identity is, I don't think we necessarily always make the same mistakes. We try to zigzag and figure things out. So like that was our thought process up front is like, this is gonna go differently because the personnel we have on our team is different. And ultimately because we want to do better and be better. So that was like, first things first, just high level. From there, like, I think that there was the like music side of the house, which like, we're like, Hades town, like dark, um, evil, like villain, anti-hero, like getting into Spotify and starting to just like flood a playlist with like a bunch of music. And you'd be like literally flabbergasted by like the range of that music. But like we eventually landed on really like, I think the centerpiece of this show is House of the Rising Sun. And that song brought together this explosiveness that we can have in an aggressive show with harsh blacks against a stark white. And it pulled you down into an introspective place where you're the, like, the lyrics are basically like, um, there was a house in New Orleans uh, called The Rising Sun. It's been the ruin of many poor boy and God, I know I'm one. And, the, and basically the house of the rising sun is a metaphor for like all the sins and all the temptations that we try to resist and none of us really can. But the point isn't like, I'm going to triumph over that. The point is like, that's in me, that's in you. It's in all of us. We have devils we know. It's it's an embrace and acceptance of something that I think the conventional show would be like, and we get out of it. You know, someone comes out in angel wings and they like ascend up through the roof of UD. We're like, <laughs> nah, fuck all that. We're not doing that shit. We're lighting this shit on fire. Like we're uh -huh. not going to, that's not what we're going to do. Right. But so we got like, so inspired by like that tune and like what that says and the, the tone of that music, especially a Mumford and Sons version, you should really check it out. I know it sounds lame, but the trombone solo after this, over yeah. this live Mumford and Sons version, we were like, that's the closer. That's the last hit of the show. Okay. Boom. How do we connect there? With, with the, you know, just thinking compositionally and like the variety, all that. But like, that's how it comes together is we're just going like, okay, that feels good over there. That feels good over there. That feels good over there. And then like, I think simultaneously we sat down and we just went like, what are cool ideas that we haven't seen? Like, again, like novelty, like innovation, like not trying to just go like lights, TVs, props, you know, all the same shit that you see with every other group, right? We're like, okay, what's different? And we originally, what you see right now, we have eight four by four stages that are magnetized on each edge. So they're 100% cool. modular. They're, those are like, yeah. And those are like our demon platforms where it can transform anyone on them into the devil, you know, it makes you a focal point and you float across the top because it's the same color as a floor. And it creates mm -hmm. this crazy ethereal thing where instead of being like that's a prop moving it just changes the method through which someone travels in a way that like i don't really think that i have seen necessarily and it's extremely challenging of course um yeah like so you're floating we on a kind cloud. of like yeah this yeah or you're you're floating on like right this Whatever. is like this this is like the devil's heaven right that's what hell is that yeah it could be your own interpretation i don't even know i'm just making it up but um we were like okay like this state these eight stages were essentially two stages actually it was one stage so it was one then it was two and then tim was like 
can we make it eight that are modular? So these flip and change and reconnect in every configuration you can do. And like that idea right there of having eight four by four stages, I think Tim was like, like, you know, next level unlocked. And it was like, okay, like I'm starting to see like how we're going to like swirl down here, how this is going to translate across the floor. And it like started to motivate like geographical choices, right. And like focal points. Cause we have this like clear beginning with the soloist and then how the stages can start to create these different like emergent environments. And then we set up these vignettes and every time it's like a different devil, you know, like we pull out a different VE member in every vignette or it's the, the two instrumentalists facing each other or like across from each other, like moments of subtle duality, right? Where there's you and the devil, you know, and almost a hundred percent of the show, you can look down and you'll find someone just staring at the judge. There's always like, we're kind of like inspired by the movie smile where there's just like a person like, uh -huh. like this and they're not like smiling but like you'll find many easter eggs of people just like staring at the judge or people looking at each other so like you can hear just how the process is very like unfolding like travis said like an idea is good and then we go boop, 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 and then like those blocks start to kind of pan out and it happens musically visually there's not really like an order to it and till we start putting the music on the page and kind of just sorting out, you know, music, that sounds good. Right. That's kind of what we're all going right, for. Right. It's not, so that's not so different. So mentioning, you mentioned music there for a second, obviously through that, um, before we get too far away from it, I, I wanted to make sure I, I asked you all, you have, you have a trombone player in the show, a saxophone player, you have the upright bass in the, in the front. Were those things you knew you wanted or elements you knew you wanted from the get-go in the planning stages or did the music kind of just that you selected just dictate we need this this is gonna more of that organic pieces falling into place is that kind of how it worked or did you know the mounted guitars in the front yeah the, the music yeah. dictated it is yeah. the main question i think the answer to that is the music dictated those choices and we got excited about just how how our aesthetic would change having a live trombone having a live saxophone, you know, we're super lucky to be plugged into school of music and the athletic band. So we have a resources to like pull people in. So like, we just were like, yeah, we're going to do this authentically. That's how we do right. The indoor drumline way to do this is to press a button and have a saxophone sound come out. That's not what we're going to do. Right. Because that's again, going to drive us towards novelty and difference instead of sameness and homogeneity. Right. That's we're we're going against the grain in every way that we possibly can. The mounted guitars was an Andrew Montero idea where he saw like someone on YouTube just, okay. And he was like, we're going to mount guitars to the keyboards. And we're all like, we've never seen that. All right. That's dope. You know, why wouldn't we do that? You you literally never seen it. Right. So again, like mm -hmm. we're the devils that WGI knows where we're like challenging the conventions and we're going like, you expect this and we're going to do this. Right. That's like part of our framework. That's definitely part of just like the story of this season for us. So I'm going to, since we're segueing to music, this will be like a two-part question. First will be for Travis on the music side, and then I'll hop over to Tim for some of the staging and visual ideas. But, you know, Travis, littered throughout the program are instances of, like, six-note groupings, which obviously 666 is very synonymous with, like, the Devil's Hour or Satan or anything like that. The show starts off with full battery, like, jump, 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 jump. And then it, like, kind of progressively gets faster ch -ch 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 -ch. and then six shots intervals here and there so did you decide early on like hey this is something we can do did you just kind of stumble across it what was the kind of motif behind that and how it came to be yeah that it was 100 percent on purpose and we just kind of let it you know be a lens through which that really that whole opener if you go through you can count a ton of six note groupings and not really with the goal of them all being noticed for being that, because that probably wouldn't sound very nice. But, you know, the the opening ones are maybe a little bit more on the nose. And we have actually, especially this last regional, had some, uh, well, we've only had two shows. But we've had a, a few people pick up on that, which is great. You know, we don't feel like the show hinges on you understanding that it's 666, but it is like a, you know, an extra layer of concept of, uh, you know, things that we thought through to have those Easter eggs there. But... Yeah, that was definitely on my mind to to work the the groupings of six in for that reason. It's almost like subliminal messaging. You get to the end, you're like, why am I thinking about that so much? Yeah. If anybody's seen the movie Focus with Will Smith, Margot Robbie, they they do that stuff throughout. Um, there's, but you, 
there's also Evan. I just want to add to that. There's a lot of instances of left hand led playing, not only because the devil sits on your left side, but because our left hands are the devils we know. So that's why the end of this first <laughs> lick, we go. Those the same hand flam drags. Yeah, across the floor. Yeah. Yep. Those. The whole snare break is centered around left hand leads. So the whole like lick and everything is like. It was like, how hard can we make this for your left hand? So if you start to watch, there's all these like, yeah, we're like just trying to figure out how to like get it under the surface of some of the writing. And then Travis, are you and Andrew kind of like going back and forth, like trying to decide, like, does he write some of the things first? There's like, hey, I need this a battery led moment. I'm going to go and then I'll send you back. What's that kind of collaboration process? Yeah, literally, literally both, you know, it depends on, you know, like for the beginning of the show, he's usually going to go first and he'll sketch out the sound design and then, you know, I'll get in there and kind of chunk out how, you know, and obviously talk very heavily with Tim and kind of chunk out where we're going to go from a battery perspective. And then him and I go back and forth and kind of dial in, you know, how we pair the voices, etc. cetera. Um, there are a couple spots where, like, all right, this is going to be a battery thing where I'll just straight write it first. Like the really the last like letter of the opener is like that. Um, and then there's some stuff, too, where it's drill led, like kind of the middle where actually we call back the uh, 2011 that drill that we all did. The uh, move six, hold two kind of craziness over oh, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Back, yeah. We, we kind of wrote the music around how many counts that was and something that could work <laughs> for us there. Hey, you know, if it sometimes if it works and it's great it works works, and it's great it works um and i I think that segues well over to uh and tim and being a part of the team you obviously have a very experienced way that you create on the floor um that i know just through text channel with travis and dan has been definitely a different experience for gmu as a whole how has that been as far as like jumping in you have these ideas for the stages. I know you like to do a lot of on hands design and creation um, and then kind of like figuring out what is going to work in person and then charting as that goes. Is that still kind of been the MO or how has that been plugging in that with the GMU crew? It's been awesome, honestly. Um, and shout out to Travis for, you know, and have to get me down there so many times so that I can kind of do my process. Um, this was a team that w- I don't think that they just like put it on charts and email it to them, right? They need like the special sauce. And um, the, the process has really been great, honestly. Um, we, it's also very, I think Travis said earlier that they're flexible. Um, and that's a great term. I mean, we'll be in the middle of a block and I'll just throw something out. Like, it just feels like the end of this snare break. And the vocals that we could tighten that up and and hit letter P with a little bit more concise GE energy, and then Monty pulls out his house computer and we send the files <laughs> around, and then like 20, 20 minutes later, we have a new MP3 and I'm staged into a new thing and it hits like it hits different and they're just like ready to make things happen um, immediately. And then the hands-on thing, obviously Travis and Dan, they they know what it's like. Um, the kids, I think it was a little bit of a learning curve, but not too bad. They, they handled it well. Um, and I kind of had to let them know, you know, when I'm staring off into space, just try and be mostly quiet and give me a second and then we'll, we'll figure it out together. Um, but they're, they're great kids. Honestly, the members are fabulous. And this is, you know, I, we generalized about the East coast, but they, they work like they rehearse hard and I don't have to tell them the same thing twice. And um, it's been really awesome, honestly. In uh, kind of the coincide with what I was mentioning to Travis about, like there's instances of like the 666 and the musical writing. I know there's flashes of that in the drill as well. Like you get, I think it's, I don't remember what part of the ensemble it is, but they have like the six and it kind of breaks apart and reforms in six. So there's many instances of that throughout the show as well as they kind of like move over towards the the stages i think um and i know from your creative process i'm sure i can just picture it in my head like all right how far can we get like yep that works that works um so it is it is a, a process but in the end game you know i think it does take time to craft these moments that are 
that are world class, like like what you're all three talking about. Um, so getting the membership to understand, like, hey, like if the show's done in January, it's probably not very good. Yeah, it's like, a problem. Probably <laughs> if we if we got it all done and like, all right, we're not gonna change anything. Like, it's probably not not great. Um, so in your head when you're hearing the music, are you trying to like, Hey, this is a, this is an image that I want to try to create, or this is maybe just, I, I want to create this density in this moment. What's that like? I know you probably do a little bit of just like routing before you get going, but your process is pretty unique. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to refer to a painting and the big brush strokes, right? Like one of my main jobs is to make sure that this is a painting of a landscape that the house is in the right spot and that the sun is in the right spot and where the trees are, that the trees aren't in front of the house or the house isn't upside down, right? That's the big brush strokes first. So most of the time, like when I start staging, I'm not, I definitely don't have things planned out. Um, I might have the big brush strokes of like, I know that we want to end with this thing at the end that feels spiral, like someone's being drawn down into hell, but how we get there, I let the music kind of dictate that. Um, and I'll, oftentimes I'll do two or three sets, right? And I just feel what the motion feels like and where my eyes going and then kind of bounce off of that into something else. And I, I have an eraser with me all the time, a mental eraser, like, okay, that doesn't feel right. And, and that's one of my, you know, Dan said, you know, I bring experience to the group. A lot of that is really just that I've, I've made enough mistakes because I've been doing it so long that I can see <laughs> like okay the thing i just did that's going to cause me problems in three weeks so let me just erase that and i'll just not have to deal with that in three weeks um and so we we do a lot of that a little, little bit of trial and error um and like the inferno drill i i tend to that's the one where it's like a group there's groups of they're rotating and it creates these little spirals that go around um and it is from stand by me i'm very kind of averse to redoing an idea like I try to pivot from anything that I've done in the past, but this was really more of like inside baseball, a shout out to actually all of you, but mostly Dan and Travis that were like, they had to learn this drill. And Dan, I think he said to the one kids, he's like, um, I want you to experience what I experienced, how this was. And so I was like, <laughs> all right, let, let's break it out. It was def I remember it was definitely a process to learn that drill, but the coolest thing about that, we changed so much of that Stand By Me show by the end of the season, but that drill okay. in the center of the circles was the only thing. Yeah. You wrote that really early on, and that never changed. Never changed. Never changed once. Yeah, well, it's not <laughs> changing here either. Yeah, there you go. So um, that that's one random, I guess you can call it an Easter egg for – for us, I guess, a little bit as a, as, a, as a callback, but we've talked about some of these musical Easter eggs and things with Dan and Travis. What are some, are, are there any interesting things you want the audience to pick up on visually, specific moments that like certain drill sets, you mentioned the spiral being pulled down to hell. What visually do you really want the audience to key on? Um, for me, again, it's about the strokes and some of that has to do with the stages. And the specialists, our saxophone and our bass trombone player, which shout out to the two of them, Iris and Tyler, they're they're amazing. Um, I think Iris, when that when they played that sax solo at the very beginning, that's going to be like a breath of fresh air at W night. Um, yeah. But figuring out how to get them uh, integrated into what the drill is, so they don't come back and forth into the pit and then go out and play and then come back. They are elements of the, the composition throughout. Um, also use the VE in a, a bit of a unique way. Um, George, who's one of our, he's a, a male performer that we use as kind of the Orpheus uh, from Hades Town. But then everybody else in the VE is the Eurydice. And we use that character that they can be his counterpart at any point of show. Um, the Dan referenced the floating stages, right? That's a lot about the, the devil that you don't see the devil very often in literature or in print or film walking around very much, but you often see this like levitation. And that's one of the reasons that the stages are white also. We see it with the tenor break at the very beginning. We bring it back for the snare break at the end that they're actually just floating back. Um, and one of the judges this weekend actually 
it thought they were floating. It's like, I don't know how that's happening. Um, so <laughs> that was working. He's not really a visual person, but it, it worked. Um, <laughs> and then a lot of it is just about making sure that from a composition standpoint, like I've been a fan of the group for many years and their uniqueness and their um, bravery in a lot of ways. And one of my goals has been to take that and also put it into a composition that's going to get points, right? Like this is at the end of the day, it's a comp competition. And I want to make sure that what GM youth performers are doing on the floor, that they have the best opportunity to succeed. Yeah. Heck yeah. And um, real quick, Evan, before you take it back, I, I don't think we've said this earlier, the tarp corners in the back pulled up supposed to be horns, right? Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure yep. we put that out there for anyone that didn't key on that, but go ahead, Evan. Yeah. It's the I devil got it. in uh, the floor. The devil in the floor. Um, you know, there's we talked early on in this about immersing the crowd into the show, and there's a couple points where they do that as well. Um, and I'll hop over to Dan first. Like one of them is uh if ever a de the quote I think is if ever a devil was born without a pair of horns, it was you. And like, you guys are literally like pointing at the yeah. audience. Um, and then there's another one's like, I see the devil in them. So were those moments where you're like, Hey, we can use these to suck people into what we're doing and be a part of this. Like break that How fourth did those wall. Come to be? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And like, you know, if you think about Dayton, like how it's sunken in like that and just the positioning of how the performance happens, where we started with the horns was we wanted to feel like it was there was depth to the setting like this was this angelic hell that gets putrefied by the devils we know so there was like some reasoning we actually were gonna we we're gonna stake up more of the floor on the corner um but then we did just the corners and we were like this looks better like this looks like horns and it looks it matches their shoulders and it matches some like just different motific choreography that we do and things like that. So like, we were just like, this is cool. This is kind of like, it's working. Um, but yeah, to your point, like we like ultimately want the thesis of this show or the question of the show to be like, what are the devils, you know? And like, we want not only the audience to walk away with that, but like our judges, right? Like that there's a message that they can walk away from and go like, what are my devils like as a judge? Like, what are my what are my devils as a fan that wants to move to the next level? Like, what are the devils I know as the parent watching who has like struggled to watch my kid who's like working through their first indoor season and like they're like struggling or whatever? Like, it's really like and and the way I think about the show is like it's a Rorschach test for devils you know. Like when you watch this, the more you watch, you're gonna be like, oh, there's an instance right there where the bass drums are in a circle and George is like looking around at all of them. And then they like coalesce or whatever, or just all these instances of like connection, like you, the devil, you know, showdown, like even the end of the show, the instrumental instrumentalists around opposing parts of the floor and they create like the ultimate, you know, that, that kind of final duality between the two of them and they're blasting through the speakers soloing. Um, so just all those little instances that we can create of like the relationship between you and the devils that you know, and ultimately that is the devil that lives in you. That's why... It is House of the Rising Sun. And at the very end of the show, we go, I'm one. And that I'm, when you listen to a song, you don't go like, oh, Brandon Boyd and Incubus is talking about himself. You listen to Brandon Boyd, you go, that's me. And you listen to art or you experience it, you experience it through the eyes of the author or the creator and it becomes you. That's where like empathy is built in terms of why we like, like to experience art and what we take away from it. So like that's what you latch onto is like I'm one. I am a devil that I know. That's what the message really is. So when we look at the audience, and you'll see so many instances of us staring at the judges, not being scared to look at them, right? They're they're a devil that we know. We go, I don't want to look at Jeff Prospery when I'm in DCI finals because I'm gonna tick or whatever. We're doing the opposite. We're like, look right at it, right? Don't shy away from those devils that you know. So pointing and going in them right in the audience who i might be like intimidated by or the judges where i'm afraid are gonna like pick out some like you know bs thing that doesn't matter whoever it might be like it's out there right so i think there is like a sense of trying to break the fourth wall and like you know again having a more like immersive introspective property to the show instead of it being like a surface read where you go like hansel and gretel to the house and then the witch and then like everything was like good at the end whatever like 
that's not what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to leave and go like, this is an experience that I just had, right? And I'm like asking right. myself these questions rather than us telling you and it being like this like didactic, like teaching moment. Like, I don't think that's what we're trying to do. This is how you're supposed to feel, you know, not. Nah. It's almost like, uh, you know, I think you, the Rorschach test is a great analogy. Like what you see is what you get. Like what I see is different from what you see. And it's, uh, that's a great way to, to design and create a world for people because you like, say you leave the movie theater and like the guy next to you is like, Oh, I think it was about this. And you're like, well, I think it was about this or like the, the end of a uh, shutter Island where you're like, this, he, this is that, or this is that, or inception is <laughs> like, Oh no, the, the dauber did move. It didn't move. Like you kind of have this, like, well, I experienced it this way versus uh, you. And like, it's, you're, you're always right pretty much. Um, which is a great, you know, obviously choice to make. I, I love that. And the, the viewer or the spectator can really, I once had a, a DCI judge one time, he was talking about blue devils, 2015 show Inc. And he was judging brass. I think I don't know, he was on the field, but he was like, you know, I saw the end of that show and they open up the book and it's like a story time. And immediately I was just transported to like putting my kids to bed, reading them stories. I was like, well, that show is for you. Like those type of things where you can create a show that's like, it's mm -hmm. for you, whatever you like. Yes. Like I thought it was this. Yeah, you're right. It that's was what it, it was, was for then. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, the only other really question I had was, you know, there's the moment with like the ropes and I'm not sure who to direct this towards as far as like, what the intent or symbology is between the ropes and what we do with those and around the props as well as the performers. Yeah, I'll Tim, take, take it. it. Um, it's, it's really a little more literal than you might think, right? The things in our lives, our demons, the things that are holding us back that we're bound by, the ropes are just a symbol for that, right? It's pretty straightforward. We're held down by things, the devils in our lives, whether it's other people, whether it's our inner demons. And we use the ropes to constrain some of the perform, to hold them back, um, to keep their devils inside of them. And um, we use them to uh, rotate the, the stages at the very end. So we're kind of tying in the flotation as that's rotating around to create chaos and, and that's indicative of the world around us. Uh, and one of the things that we really feel strongly about is that this activity, you know, it's really turned into art. People are calling themselves artists when they do this activity. And I think that this show is one that I would want to perform in. And that's, I think, the best gift we give them. And that's why we're doing this activity in the first place, or, or it should be. Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, I... Think I like we nailed through my list. Like I, I want to give this opportunity though. Like if there's, if there's some other kind of roll out the red carpet for team GMU, at least the ones that we have here that you want to shout out for the show or people to take away, or just like, you know, like tune in, make sure you make sure you got your ears and your eyes open. Like if there's anything else that you guys want to make sure that you're pointing across, I want to give you all the opportunity to just be like, yep, we got this, this, and this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. Well, Mike, I think you might have been about to say something if you got a question. No, I was going to start wrapping things up, wildly. but I like what Evan just did there. So we'll go with that first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll speak from, from my seat at least. And like, I'll just go back to like, what, what is the future of where we are all going, whether it be like independent world. And I think independent world sort of sets the momentum for like how other uh, you know, groups design how other like, you know, circuits follow suit, whatever. It should. Um, I think independent world is, it, it's the beacon. Like, and I think mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Um, are we headed towards a kind of, again, like homogeneity where we all turn into various versions of a thing or two, or are we trying to carve out our own path? I think that, we do that. I think that we are looking to check our boxes and get the judges to say the words on the sheet or synonyms to those words. But I think that if I can inspire the kids watching us to be in drumline and to understand like what can be gleaned from those experiences, like we know how much 
you take away from doing this. Like, it's very like, like, yeah, we all play snare drum really well, like on this call. That's great. And we can all like go play loose together one day and that's cool or whatever. And I'll break as I always did. But, I don't like, remember the second half the of it. Other... <laughs> yeah, no. Nah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but like, I just think like for us, like, and this was something that, I mean, it, it, you know, the direction that we're in is like, we were at the advisory board meeting and like, you know, Tim um, or Mike Jackson or whoever is just like, you guys have to keep going in the direction you are going. And I think when you look at the landscape, there's a lot of people that are swimming in the same direction and we are not swimming in that direction whatsoever. And I don't think that when Travis writes, he's like, what's the motif of this year? I don't think when Tim writes, he's like, what's the motif or whatever, like, we're looking to create something that is authentic to us. And I am more interested in the decibel level of our audience members than necessarily the, you know, score at the end. But I think that you can get both. Right. And I think that we have done a decent job of doing these things. Right. But we're also really good at teaching drum lines. And sometimes we've decentered that in the, you know, seeking out a really like original approach which i love like i love a lot of the shows we've done like that's fine but like we are very good at making drum lines good and badass and special and different like not Heck you can yeah. point out a drum line and go dan and travis right look go look at those lines and you're like these are like signature lines that you don't see every year i don't think that we all need to swim in the same direction do the same thing follow the same patterns and this year, we're not going to sacrifice the competition for that. The competitive aspect is heavily in the thought process of what we're doing, but you're not going to see us, I think, kind of give in to the devil you know, which is let's just do what we know is going to work and fit into the parameters of this thing. Like, that's not what this is about at all. And I think our members are getting an authentic experience because of that, that it's not just plug and play same old thing but different name that type of deal so like you all know obviously what i'm saying and everyone listening knows what i'm saying but we're all seeing this happen right and we as the designers at the independent world level need to teach the judges what's right or wrong and we're going to push them and they judge us to to work harder and to recognize like the complexity and the nuance of what we're doing and We'll see where that goes. It doesn't matter. We There's so much, like, uh, there's enough time left that nothing's written in stone, I don't think. Like, literally none of the placements at the end, but I, I just be. think that... Yeah, I'd hope not. No, I don't... <laughs> well, well, we can talk about that later, but I just think that we we are committed to staying on the path of what we've been doing, and we're doing it with fucking rocket launchers this year. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be pretty sick at the end yeah yeah cool well uh we mike and i will have phenomenal seats to watch it at the end um oh, for real? so yeah we'll be like there in that vip seating i'll be like next to whoever's judging music like all right i'm hearing what you're hearing so um yeah we'll be in there but uh are you guys gonna be like exclusively worried about the electronics balance even though you're in the music seat yeah probably not <laughs> since that's probably meant for the top box but you know um uh, that's fine um <laughs> maybe put a psa out about that before dayton you understand it that's great <laughs> i've read the sheets but um, I, i'm under the impression that the judges are sitting in in more um and tim maybe you know more about this i think they're sitting in more similar locations now i think they moved hmm. yeah i think they moved it so it's more similar i think that's smart Yes. Well, I can tell you for sure yeah. from like an audio acoustic perspective, what's balanced for one person is never going to be balanced for another person. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but, yep. you know, honestly, it was great to hear a lot of this introspection on the show and just the thought process behind it. And, you know, the Hades Town thing makes perfect sense. On my list, oh, I yeah. wrote like, what decided to have the trombone and sax? But you said Hades Town. I was like, oh, immediately. Um, I mean, when I'm going to have to that, go check that out now. I've never even heard of that, I, uh, so I'm going to check it out after this. When I saw that off Broadway, like the yeah. trombone player in that performance just stole the whole show. Um, so that makes total sense. And, you know, I love doing these because 
jealously and uh, pridefully. It helps me as a uh, spectator just appreciate them even more than I already do for the hard work that goes in from design and uh, more so the hard work that goes in from the membership. So I really can't wait to see it in person. Uh, oh, yeah. Which won't be until April, but it is what it is because you guys are like nine hours away. It's a little far, but uh, yeah. I This has been, helped me immensely. I picked up on a few of those things you all talked about, but learned a ton new. I hope anyone listening learned a ton. Highly recommend. go. F- There's a couple runs from March at some point that are decent vantage points. Go check it out. Um, you, you can at least pick up on a lot of the visual stuff and the floating floor and all that kind of stuff. Really cool. Um, anybody else got anything before we wrap this up? Nope. All right. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Comment, like, subscribe, share the video with anyone you think would appreciate anything we talked about tonight to appreciate GMU's show from this season a little better. Uh, Again, Facebook, Instagram, patreon.com, or hit the join button right on YouTube. And we'll see everybody in the next one. The devil you know. Peace. Smash that like. Smash the like button.